Well, hippies did things that were worthy of incarceration. And I was uh, there, I met a fellow who was under 30. Now, I liked people under 30. See, I wouldn't even trust myself today. Now I'm over 30. But back then, you wouldn't trust anybody over 30. And I, and I met this guy. He was a young fellow. He had been busted like I was and put in jail. He had enough money for me to get out, but not for him. And he was sitting in the corner and reading a well-worn Gideon Bible. And he was reading it and reading it and reading it and had a whole different spirit about him. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I liked it and I wanted it. I mean, I knew the words of the Old Testament anyway. I knew about not stealing and about uh, loving God and all that stuff. But here I was just a few days earlier uh, when people would go into their... Uh, I was staying at a youth hostel in Florida. And when guys would go in to take showers, I'd rifle their pockets and steal from them. Although I knew that it was against my religion, against my morals, but I needed to live. So here I see a guy who's not only reading a book and having a different spirit, but he's willing to give me the money, give me the money, to get me out of jail. And he wasn't doing this. Uh, no, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't so convinced of it himself, he was just investigating. But that book had changed him enough that he wanted to give and share. Now that was a powerful testimony to me, but he never mentioned Jesus. And uh, when I left that jail, I kicked my heels as high as I could, and that's pretty hard with two left feet. Um, and, and I just had a, a, an excited moment. But then as I continued to travel up the beach, I realized I still wasn't happy. But at least I was free. And I traveled to Washington, D.C. This is spring 71 now. And uh, from there, my parents flew me back here to Kansas City uh, for Passover. It's a family reunion time. It's a, an important celebration to remember that we were slaves and now we're free. So I could kind of identify. I got back to Kansas City and uh, we had the traditional Seder. Uh, many of your, your uh, viewers will have, will have seen those things. Uh, they're, they're wonderful depictions of what God has done in history. And like all good Jewish folk, we, we like to eat when we celebrate. And like all good meals, if you're going to have a, a, a festival, a holiday, you might as well eat while you're doing it. And use the symbols in the, in the food to remind yourself of what God did. So the Passover was and is. And yet I was still interested in life, meaning. And we went through the traditional Seder, the traditional Jewish liturgy surrounding the meal, and it was boring to me. The second night, my last night then in Kansas City, uh, we had a second Seder. After a couple minutes into it, I said, are we going to go through this whole thing again, the road to ritual prayers with no life? My mother stands and says, I have an idea. Let's let Bob lead the Seder tonight. Well, I thought I would be the best one to do it anyway. And uh, in all my humility, I took the Haggadah, the, the, the prayer book of the day, and we began to talk through the story. Then we even closed it and just talked about slavery and Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King and, and uh, the hippies and Jews and Egypt. And it was a wonderful time. Then we got to the section in the, in the Haggadah that says, Let us sing unto the Lord a new song. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. My mother says, so how does that song go? There's a particular liturgical hymn that's sung then. And I said, no, 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 let's do it like it says, a new song. Well, my sister and cousin begin to sing a popular song of the day about Jeremiah and a bullfrog and joy to the world. A new song, huh? Uh, well, that was new, and it did have Jeremiah, so it seemed religious. But I didn't think it was religious enough, so my other cousin and I began to sing Handel's Hallelujah Chorus uh -huh. from Messiah. Now that, although a hallelujah, didn't exactly bring joy to my parents. For when I, uh, Shawnee Mission East, I graduated, and I used to sing in the choirs, and every year at Christmas, or now they call it winter concert, we used to sing the, uh, the Hallelujah Chorus. 2,000 people, the whole auditorium would rise and stand and, and listen, except for two adults sitting in the first row of the balcony, and it was always my parents, and they would never stand. So the Hallelujah Chorus was not a smart move. Well, the cacophony of those two singing uh, Jeremiah's Bullfrog and, and our singing the Hallelujah Chorus and my grandmother on this side and my grandmother on this side yelling, Oi, what's going on? It was quite a noise and quite a stir. And then my father throws his hands in the air and says, Shah, quiet. 
he took the Haggadah and he began to read again, and I knew I would never find the joy and meaning of the Passover again. We drank the second cup, and I pushed away from the table, and I said, I'm leaving. Now, you never leave before the fourth cup. But I did. I had to. I didn't know what I was going to do. I walked outside, and for the first time in my life, I prayed in English. I'd never prayed before in English. I'd always prayed the Hebrew prayers. They were good enough for the rabbis, good enough for my rabbi, good enough for my parents. Who am I to invent new ones? But that night, I looked up to heaven, and I don't even remember just what I said, but the gist of it was, here I am, the righteous one. <laughs> <laughs> All humility. Uh, here I am, and I'm trying to do what's right and relate this Passover, this archaic 3,500-year-old holiday to me. And But I'm out here. And those hypocrites, <laughs> I call them hypocrites, uh, the hypocrites in there, they're doing it your way. I'm, is there another way? Well, that was what I prayed, kind of. I didn't even know how to talk to God. I mean, what do you say? Uh, sir, I, you know, I didn't know how to, to address him. Well, that night I went home and had what, what psychiatrists would call a nervous breakdown. Went to uh, Menorah Hospital where I was born and took up residence in their psychiatric ward. And after a couple weeks, I was back to normal, although the uh, psychiatrist said, we don't know what to do with him. And they basically washed their hands of me. A few days later, I went for a walk in Volker Park, right by the Nelson Art Gallery, one of my favorite places, and certainly the hippie hangout in 1971. There I met a couple of Jesus freaks. They were out with their Bibles and crosses, and I walked past them and they said, do you know the Lord is with you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I need these kinds of people. So I walked on past, and 20 feet later, I stopped. I now know the word is heavily convicted, but then I turned around, I sat down, I said, I'm Jewish, go ahead. Well, you know what they're going to do? They're going to take their Bible and just, that's what they did. They flipped, oh, oh, Jew, Whoosh, Old Testament, flip, flip, flip. Here's Jesus, here's Jesus. Except there's a problem. See, they were four weeks old in the Lord. They mm. didn't know very much. They might have known, for God so loved the world, but I don't know that they could have finished that sentence. But they knew somebody. And they said, after a two-hour conversation, we may not know all the answers. But God does. Why don't you go and ask him about it? No, wait a minute. I'd heard the, uh, you, you don't pray and ask God a theological question. You don't bother him from such things. He's busy answering prayers for health and prosperity. And anyway, we've got rabbis and books. We, we could look it up, the answers. But that night, I prayed now the second time in my life. And I asked God something like, OK, so who's this Jesus character? Pardon my vernacular. They also gave me a Bible. Now, I'd read the Old Testament all my life. I'd studied the Talmud and the, all the, the uh, commentaries about it. I was not phenomenal in my knowledge, but I knew a lot. But they gave me a book with red letters and black letters and St. Matthew and St. This One, all these Catholics, St. Mark, St. Luke. I mean, everybody in there is Catholic except for the Baptist guy, John. Uh, <laughs> and, and I began to wonder, how could any of these... You know, how could a Jew understand this uh, Goisha book? I mean, every movie I'd ever seen, Jesus looked like uh, a Norwegian instead of a Jew. And uh, even in Da Vinci's picture of the last Seder meal, they've got him eating big puffy white bread and some northern Italian fish. I mean, nothing Jewish about this thing. Um, but that night I began to read the book of Matthew, St. Matthew. And after five chapters, I was amazed and wondered how a, how a Catholic or a Baptist could understand it. It was so Jewish. Mm. And on and on I read, but wait a minute. Jews don't believe in Jesus, and I knew I wasn't an orphan. So how does this work? Well, I was scared. I mean, as long as there's a distance between you and, and uh, this Jesus character, I, I was between me and Jesus, I felt a little safe. I could read it intellectually. I could read it some kind of analytically. But don't let it touch me. Well, I admired Jesus. He was a great philosopher. He certainly knew how to lead people. Um, and I read the book of Revelation that night. I, didn't, I don't know that I know much more about it today, 14 years later, but I do know it scared <laughs> the living daylights out of me. And uh, it was exciting, and I needed something apocalyptic at that point in my life. A couple days later, my father comes into my room because I had gotten out of the hospital and I was staying at his house. And Dad says, so what are you reading? He knew what I was reading. 
And I said, it's sir, um, mm, uh, the, uh, the Bible. And he said, whose Bible is it? And I went, holy? But uh, that didn't work for him. He, was, uh, he, was, he took the Bible from me, knew it was the Goetia Bible, the Gentile Bible, and threw it in the trash. I waited till he left the house, and I went in and took it out again, and I saw the Bible in a whole different light. Now there was no distance between me and this Jesus, and I was going to have to go through some things like he went through. Here I am defending him, and I don't even believe in him. The next day I went to a girl's house here in Leewood. I knew her to be a Christian, and I went up to her and said, I want this Jesus stuff, um, but I don't want your Jesus. You know what Jesus stuff is. Love, joy, peace, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. I didn't know the jargon, but I knew I wanted it. But I don't want Jesus. And she said, and God bless her holy boldness, you don't get this Jesus stuff unless you take Jesus. Mm. Man, those were apples of gold words right to my heart, fitly spoken. And that night I prayed what's been nicknamed the sinner's prayer. I asked Jesus to cleanse me of my sins and take over my life and be the boss. Well, that was 14 years ago. He's still the boss. I wish I'd obey him more, uh, but he's still the Lord. And so it wasn't until you developed a seeker's heart and really wanted the truth, regardless of the costs, that you found truth. That's right. And you can imagine the surprise of my family when I went home and told them, Mom, Dad, I've become a Christian. I wish someone would have told me, sit down for a few days, let it sink in a, a little. Years. A few years, who knows how long it takes. And Stan is <laughs> chuckling because you were on the other end of that. Right. Were you you see, the, the thing that, that is just filling me right now is that Bob was seeking. He didn't know what, he didn't know where, but he was seeking. I was repelling, I was rejecting, I didn't want this. And the important thing that you have to hear is that the Word of God never returns for it. He heard, Bob God. heard. And the Spirit of God reached in his heart and made contact. And grabbed me. And it only took three days from the time I genuinely heard the Word. I mean, people out in your audience might know some Jewish people whom they say, oh, they'll never believe in Jesus. And they shrink from telling him the Gospel, concluding they will never believe. Who are we to conclude someone else's eternal destiny? Uh, I was as hard as you could be. And three days later was a believer. It's God's power to soften hearts. What did you do? I mean, did you uh, just walk into one of those Baptist churches or one of those Methodist churches? Or, or did you just make church your heart and start from there? Was that the starting No, point? the people who originally shared with me out there at the park uh, were uh, members of a, a community here in Kansas City that was fairly new and had a lot of young people, uh, people who looked like me and talked like me and could relate to me. So I quickly joined in with their church, and uh, uh, they invited me. I went to the Bible study the next night and, and uh, wanted to devour the things of the Bible. There was so much to learn. And I read through it and read through it. New Testament, Old Testament, Old, New, Old, New, and Bible studies were exciting. And There was a, a joy in, in knowing God and being cleansed of my sin. So I didn't need more religion. I had plenty of religion. And uh, what I needed was the relationship with God and the exuberant joy that he gave. Now, while I'm sitting here thrilling with this testimony, how do most Jewish people respond to this? Most Jewish people ignore the gospel. Just completely it's ignore for you. you, by ignoring the gospel, ignore you. Yeah, it's for you. I'm glad you're happy. Leave me alone. Really? You know, it's not so much the two extremes of curiosity and hostility. Most Jewish people, most Passivity. Gentiles, are, are, are ignorant, I'm sorry, are uh, ignoring the things that we say. So and it's okay, that's fine. Say it's fine lovey. for you, that's right. Uh, if it's, if it, they, they say you can talk about anything but religion and politics. You can even talk religion. You can even talk politics. What they say is, you can't impose your religion on me. So that's when this ignoring becomes hostile, is when we begin to press or thrust a broadside, a gospel tract into a, a, a and, and yet we've, view. And we've just been told, though, that's not the way to do it. So what is the way? The way? If we knew, if anybody knew <laughs> the way, we'd be done a long time ago. What's must, the I way? I must have dejected and said you this. There was a, an article in the Long Island Council of, of um, Churches to put out some years ago, maybe 1977 or 78, talking about Jewish people who believe in Jesus. 
and they're saying these people have to make up their mind. They're either Jews or they're Christians. They can't be both. And I remember seeing that and I just shook my head. This is from the chairman or the president of the council, uh, the Long Island Council of Churches. And he said, these Jews have to make up their mind. They're either Jews or Christians. You can't be both. Where, where does that say? Where do you find that? How did you handle that? Well, there, there have always been Jews who've believed in Jesus I didn't ever know since that. the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my best friends are Jews for Jesus. Um, now, what the church did, now I don't know if you've been to Tel Aviv, there's a diaspora museum right there in Tel Aviv, and up on a third floor tucked away somewhere is a panorama called Bearing the Cross, and it's a third century um, picture of a plaza scene somewhere Antioch, Rome, I don't know where it was, in which the, the bishop and some priests were standing around with a big cross and they were calling, according to the description underneath, the caption saying they were Yehudim Notzrim, Jewish Christians, calling to them to leave the synagogue and come bear the cross, be, be uh, all the way Christians, quit being Jews. Mm -hmm. Now that struggle from the Long Island Council and from this particular panorama is a historical difficulty for the Jew in coming to faith. The greatest hindrance for the Jew in accepting Jesus, usually, generally speaking, is the social consequence that I won't have my family, I will be uh, disqualified from being buried in a Jewish cemetery. Uh, I will lose my inheritance. I will lose my friends. Uh, Jesus talked about counting the cost and the Jewish boys of his day understood. Mm. And uh, a lot of uh, Gentiles in America, westernized, Christianized, uh, they, they say, leave father and mother. Why? They're, Mom and dad have been praying for me for years to become Christians. Uh, but I think a Jewish person can well understand those cost counting things in the Bible. Uh, so for the Jew to come to faith, the church has to be big enough to say, come in and be a Jew and believe in Jesus. Instead of saying, uh, take off your yarmulke, take off your talus, uh, throw it, uh, have a pork tenderloin, uh, worship on Sunday, forget this Saturday malarkey. And uh, we've got to let the Jew be a Jew in the church. We've got to build a big enough kingdom that the Jew can be a Jew in, in Christ. Is that being done progressively? I think otherwise? so. Now, now the, in, in a lot of churches, there's still some uh, latent anti-Semitism against Jews who believe in Jesus, quit being a Jew, and then we can handle you as an O'Shaughnessy rather than a uh, Schwartz. <laughs> you know, just change your name, sprinkle some water, and we're all set. But the, uh, the community, of the, the church community, in the last 70, 80 years has broadened its tents in such a way, I think, that the whole messianic movement, the uh, all kinds of Jewish missions have really sprung forth and are doing well, and the church is saying it's okay to be Jewish and believe in Jesus. Now, where is Jews for Jesus camped? In the church, outside of the church? And obviously, as a missionary for Jews for Jesus, there, there are some proven ways well, let's talk about that. Well, we have a style that we've employed. It's not the style. I don't, as I said, I don't know the style. Um, I John think I do. Let, let me help you. I John? think I do. I, okay. think, I think we're getting there today. Okay. <laughs> I think the style is one, it's, we can't even call it a style. I think it's just love and really caring. Well, that's the backdrop to all true Christianity. It's not necessarily the manner of approaching people, but it's certainly the attitude we better have, even if it's tucked as far away as it was in those four Atlanta boys. And yet there in, in that jail, it was that man's love for you, instilled by his reading of the Word, mm -hmm. that impressed you. That was an impressive uh, behavior. If, if a book, if a book, and at that time you thought it was a book, we know it to be a man can bring about that love, then, then why not get in and be one of the bunch? That's right, but I wouldn't know him unless someone confronted me with the issue of Jesus. I mean, these hippies, Jesus freaks, as we called them, now we call them Yeshua freaks, mm -hmm. because Jesus is Yeshua in English. Um, they told, they had Jesus is Lord in ink written on their blue jeans. I mean, they were sold out to Jesus, and they wanted me to get in on it specifically related to Jesus. Um, the backdrop has to be love. How it's brought to somebody is the style. And then we're, we're to Jews for Jesus. Yeah. And um, how is it brought? 
we do it in all kinds of manners. We have uh, gospel music teams that take our music to the street corners and campuses and churches and wherever we can go. Uh, we have our gospel tracks that are sometimes uh, handed out on North Beach in San Francisco uh, or at uh, the Los Angeles Olympics. We hand out about three million in New York City alone every year. Uh, we've got about seven of us full-time in New York and a few volunteers come and help us. And it's a, it's a planting, not a pushing. It's a planting. Well, it in, toss from the my seed and it looks like it lands. Yours. It depends how deep it goes. When we put our full page advertisements in the paper that say the Messiah has come and his name is Yeshua, or we put it in Time Magazine or in USA Today, when we do that and we spend hundreds of thousands over the last few years in getting the gospel out in the media through advertisements, we draw in an awful lot of people who we would not reach by the distributions of, of pamphlets. Uh, we then reach people by distributing pamphlets or by wearing a silly Jesus made me kosher t-shirt or Jews for Jesus t-shirt. Um, we draw in people that way who are more interested in the debate and then come in rather than just looking at an ad and passing it by. Uh, a lot of Christians write to us and I, I've seen the San Francisco address uh, flashed on the screen already today. The, uh, that's the headquarters of Jews for Jesus. People will write our California address and say, please witness to my Jewish friend. And if they've already done the beginning work, whether it be in Florida or Colorado or Illinois, wherever the, the Christian audience is, when, when they will uh, uh, write in and say, I've been witnessing to Mrs. Goldberg, she's my neighbor, and she's cons considering this, would you help me? It's a whole lot better than, I've got a doctor, he doesn't know I'm a Christian, would you please mm -hmm. do all the work for me so mm -hmm. I don't have to put my life on the line and tell him about Jesus. If I can challenge uh, the people of something beautiful, in any way it's going to be to uh, to go out and tell others about Jesus. They, I really. Uh, it's not going to come unless we tell them. Now, sometimes angels come down and do visitations, and sometimes people just, hmm, there's a Bible, I think I'll get saved, or turn, you know what I mean? It doesn't happen very often like that. They might turn on a television evangelist and, and listen to him, but it's the personal confrontation. I like to tell the story of St. Matthew, uh, chapter 16. Jesus is receiving the, the brothers coming back from a trip around and he sent them out to do some mission work and they come back in and he says who do people say that I am I like that in evangelism it's twice as many ears as mouths and we ought to keep that percentage who not what did you say about me but what are people saying and they said well some say you're this dead man or that dead man Jeremiah Elijah all these dead people he said but who do you say that I am now that was a confrontational statement who do you say that I am? And nobody can say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, unless they hear that question. Whoever says it, whether it be the book or a television or, or, or an angel or most of the time, another Christian. Who do you say that Jesus is? That's a, a wonderful question uh, to challenge. And it looks aggressive, it looks military, it looks confrontational. But it's, it's the, the only way they can get in on it is to confess Jesus. Uh, as uh, St. Peter did right at that point. And uh, so there. <laughs> so, you, so there. So there you have to answer the question. And many times answering it implies some research, as in your case, Stan. You can't be ignorant. You have to learn. You have to listen. You have to investigate. And uh, sooner or later, the truth of the word is going to just pierce your heart. If you inquire, God said, I will be found of those who diligently seek for me. And as we seek for him, he reveals himself. The rocks cry out mm. the glory in, of God. In John chapter 3, in John chapter 4, we have the two methods of evangelism that don't help us at all. You see, because some people want to choose one or the other. John 3, we had a rabbi, a man, a scholar, an intellectual, approached Jesus and came at nighttime. Um, in John chapter 4, we have a woman a not-so-honorable woman. Jesus approached her. It was midday. And uh, so who's, which is the best way of evangelism? Uh, the record of the scripture says, uh, whenever you can, speak about the Lord. You so know be I mean? bold about this thing. 
but don't with a sensitive genuine we, love right. we can't be ashamed of the good news of Jesus we can't be ashamed and I think that's what brother Bob is saying and that's what you're saying that's what I'm saying we can't be ashamed of it if the if there's been the kind of I was trying to picture you with the hair and the beard and the feet <laughs> and all that but if that kind of a transformation could take place in you and I know the transformation that's taken place in me if we too uh, years apart in age but united as brothers in the reality of Jesus if this can really happen to us, what, what can it do for the rest of the world? That's right. And in the beginning, the gospel was Jewish. And it took 10 years and a sheet coming down from heaven. <laughs> now, we should have the working hours St. Peter did. I mean, he was, <laughs> yeah. what was it, noon, 3 in the afternoon? Right. He was asleep in the afternoon in Joppa <laughs> in Tel Aviv. Right. Yeah, having a great time. A little <laughs> siesta. And this vision comes down, whops him upside the head, and, and he wakes up. He sees all these bacon double cheeseburgers and red lobster <laughs> shrimp. And, and he says, what is this, Trafe? And he says, rise up, Peter, kill and eat. And it took...